You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, Episode 9, Sonnet 8. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What if I say I'm not, not just another no. one in your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? In this week's news, I have an embarrassing announcement to make. In my enthusiasm for this project, I almost made a grave error that would have been deeply regrettable. Today was the day I was scheduled to get images representing sonnets 2 and 3 tattooed onto my arm, and yesterday was the first time that I fully understood the implications of my doing this when my son is home for the summer. This summer is already gearing up to be a scorcher. My wife is injured and cannot take him swimming, and I'm not getting any leave from my day job, so every opportunity that I have to get in the water with him will be precious, and no tattoos are worth taking these next four weeks away from him. I've already spoken to the artist, and as soon as my boy returns to school in mid-January, I will resume with the project, most likely doing sonnets four and five the week after in order to get back on track with my personal schedule. Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions, and more importantly, for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. Please keep your suggestions and criticism coming. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 8. This is one of my favorite sonnets, because it's one of the clearer keys that Shakespeare provides for the reader. First things first, a reminder that the word sonnet literally means little song, and that each sonnet is both a little song and a little son, a reflection of Shakespeare and a replacement for Shakespeare's lost son, Hamlet. Music to hear, why hearest thou music sadly? The first phrase, music to hear, serves both as an address and as a declaration of the subject of the verse, depending on whom is being addressed. Music is interesting both for its clearly understood meaning as well as for referring to its origin, the art of the muses. And as Hamlet is Shakespeare's muse, Shakespeare is the sonnets. If each sonnet is intended to be sounded out, then the sequence itself becomes one long song. But music is not always enjoyable, and in this case, Shakespeare's grief is its theme. The sonnet is the music and hears itself only when read out loud. If Shakespeare reads it out loud, it is a farewell, and if it's the reader reading it, then it is both giving life and voice back to Shakespeare himself, and a song that mourns both him and his son. Sweets with sweets war not, joy delights in joy. Why lovest thou that which thou receivest not gladly, or else receivest with pleasure thine annoy? The sonnet receives the words from Shakespeare, and is receiving his music whenever he touches pen to paper. It also receives his music when the reader reads the words out loud. The sonnet loves its master, even though it is taking all of his sadness and longing. But it also loves its mistress, a very different kind of love, a grateful love for the reader bringing it back from the darkness behind the cover of the closed book. Some of the sonnets are filled with love, and some with hate. The word annoy comes from the old French to be hateful to, and here it's to be noted that regardless of who the subject and object are in these verses, the relationship is two-way. Depending on which side of the sonnet looking glass the subject is on, they may be giving or receiving, happily or hatefully. The sonnet loves Shakespeare, even though it receives grief and bitterness amidst the love. Both Shakespeare and the reader love the sonnets, in spite of the tragedy embedded in them. If the true concord of well-tuned sounds, by unions married, do offend thine ear, they do but sweetly chide thee who confounds in singleness the parts that thou shouldst bear. The sonnets are well-tuned in every sense of the word, but also in the punning sense of being a song about the well in which Narcissus, Shakespeare, sees his reflection. Concord meant of one mind in Old French, originally from the words together and heart in Latin. It's used as agreement, and in addition to the harmonious agreement of sounds, returns us to the term contracted from the first sonnet meaning married. Confounds both means to put to shame and to mix together, confuse, or perplex. Bear both means to carry or sustain, and to give birth. 
Ignoring the traditionally understood sexual references, let's focus on the ideas of music and marriage. Each sonnet agrees with the others, is married to the others, a theme that's been strongly established since the very first sonnet. They can be offensive, certainly, in particular because from Sonnet 1 they're desperately and harshly instructing Shakespeare, the sonnets themselves, and the reader to get to work on their legacy. Whoever is being addressed, Shakespeare or the reader, is confounding or mixing together the individual sonnets of the sequence. Shakespeare is bearing the sequence by writing it. The reader is bearing it by reading it. Additionally, as Sonnet 8 is the latest sonnet in the sequence, it is confounding, or shaming and perplexing, the rest of the sequence if it doesn't lead into the next sonnets. Mark how one string, sweet husband to another, strikes each in each by mutual ordering. Mark means to take note of, but is also a verb instructing Shakespeare and the sonnet to sign or indicate that the ordering of the sequence is critical to producing the correct music. String in those days meant the string of an instrument and a number of objects arranged in a line. The word strikes recalls the word offends from the previous quatrain, and each sonnet, each line or string, works together with its predecessor and its successor to form a coherent narrative or pleasing note. Resembling sire and child and happy mother, who, all in one, one pleasing note do sing. Resembling, as mentioned in the previous episode, make a note reassembling. The lines and verses of the sonnets represent Shakespeare and his family, recalling better days prior to Hamlet's and Shakespeare's deaths, and in their entirety carry the following message. Whose speechless song, being many, seeming one, sings this to thee, thou single wilt prove none. The speechless song, already mentioned in my analysis of sonnets 3, 4, and 7, is the written sonnet. Seeming meant both appearing to be and befitting. There are many sonnets that appear as a unified whole in the sequence, but they are also suited to one single Shakespeare. This sequence sings one continuous theme. With no legacy, you are nothing. Not Shakespeare, not the individual sonnets, and not the reader. It has just occurred to me that wilt from the 1690s meant fade, droop, and wither as it does today, and the rose that is the symbol of the bard and the metaphor for his sonnet reflections will wither and fade if the sonnets are not written and read. Shakespeare is making music with the sonnets. Each sonnet is a single note of a beautiful but tragically sad song that mourns its sire, Shakespeare, its child, Hamnet, and its happy mother, Anne Hathaway. Those are all long gone, but the sonnets remain, proving by this reading that Shakespeare's efforts were, ironically, not in vain. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording these podcasts, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support me at www.patreon.com slash fisherking, and please join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnet comics with an x. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another enough. one in your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if I say I will never surrender? surrender.